We are now without any money in our treasury, powder in our magazines, arms in our stores, without a brigadier, engineers, expresses. By and by, when we shall be called upon to take the field, we shall not have a tent to lie in. I have often thought how much happier I should have been if, instead of accepting a command under such circumstances, I had taken my musket upon my shoulders and entered the ranks, or had retired to the back country and lived in a wigwam. George Washington. All seems lost, even before it's begun, until a former bookseller has an idea that will change everything. January 1st, 1776. It's a new year for a new army, and General Washington raises a new flag to commemorate it, the Grand Union, with 13 stripes representing both the differences and common cause of the 13 colonies, and with the British Union Jack in the upper left to acknowledge those colonial leaders hoping to salvage a relationship with England. That same day, the colonies get the news of the King's October proclamation to crush the rebellion by any means necessary. It's a stunning declaration by the King that rouses rebel ire more than ever. But an army needs more than anger to fight a war. With the onset of winter, neither side has the supplies necessary to brave the cold and snow. The British hole up in Boston, waiting for reinforcements and supplies from England, while Washington uses the time to piece together an army short on everything from manpower to gunpowder. But help is on the way. Henry Knox, a 25-year-old colonel and former Boston bookseller, is leading a trek from Cambridge to Fort Ticonderoga on a quest for arms. Knox has taken it upon himself to recover the artillery captured from the British at Fort Ticonderoga. For two months in the cold and wet, he, his men, and teams of oxen haul 120,000 pounds of artillery across 300 miles of muddy woods, frozen rivers, and steep icy slopes back to headquarters in Cambridge. On January 25th, Colonel Knox delivers all of the weaponry to his commander-in-chief, miraculously intact. It is the best gift Washington could ever receive. Finally, he has the firepower he so badly needs. Washington also has in Knox a valued new commander in charge of artillery. Knox becomes part of Washington's inner circle of junior officers whose counsel he values enormously. George Washington always had the ability to listen to many people, particularly younger men. He thinks everybody's view is important, that it's a part of the puzzle, that people know things that he doesn't know, and if he can listen to enough opinions, he'll know as much as they do. A hallmark of good leadership. Right away, Washington's brain trust keeps him from making a fatal mistake. As the spring thaw approaches, Washington wants to send waves of foot soldiers down into Boston in a full frontal attack. But his officers overrule him. The British are too well fortified, and the Continentals are still short of gunpowder. They do, however, have Knox's artillery. They decide to take the highest ground, Dorchester Heights, and bombard the city. March 2nd. After months of waiting, Washington and his men are more than eager to move. The general is about to launch the first offensive of his command. He sends a stern warning to his troops. Our posterity depends upon the vigor of our exertions. 
If any man in action shall presume to skulk, hide himself, or retreat from the enemy without the orders of his commanding officer, he will be instantly shot down as an example of cowardice. General Washington. The night of March 4th. Surprise will be the key. From three points outside the city, Cobble Hill, Leechmere, and Roxbury, the Army rains light cannon fire down on Boston. A decoy to misdirect the British, while the rest of the Army hauls Knox's artillery over to Dorchester Heights. Through the night, Washington's men build fortifications and drag cannon up the steep, frozen slope. By morning, everything is in place. Daybreak, March 5th. On the sixth anniversary of the Boston Massacre, the British awake to the sight of 20 cannon pointed down on their ships in the harbor. My God, a shocked Howe exclaims, these fellows have done more work in one night than I could make my army do in three months. It's not until after the they see Ticonderoga's guns on Dorchester Heights that they realize they gotta get the heck out of there. The Continentals don't even need to fire a shot. Howe issues a futile order for his ship's cannon to fire on the Continental position, but Washington's guns sit just out of range. Luckily for Howe, his ships are also out of Washington's range. Howe and his army prepare to abandon the city and take thousands of Loyalist citizens with them. One loyalist would later write, The necessary care of the women, sick and wounded, required every assistance that could be given. It was not like the breaking up of a camp where every man knows his duty. It was like departing your country with your wives, your servants, your household furniture, and all your encumbrances. Over the next two weeks, the Continentals watch from above as all of Boston scrambles to evacuate, taking everything with them that isn't nailed down. It is a bitter exile for the Loyalists, many of whose families had lived in Boston for generations. By March 17th, they are all gone. 120 ships carry 9,000 Redcoats, 2,000 Loyalists, and as many of the city's usable goods as possible out to an unknown fate. The Patriots return to the city the beloved birthplace of the rebellion, and Washington enjoys the first victory of his command. But it will be his last for the rest of a grueling and humiliating year. 1776 will see 33,000 British troops, the largest contingent ever sent overseas, head for America to grind the revolution into dust.